you have to get up damned early in the morning to beat the TriStar. And we in the flight test business want to keep it that way. I'm Hank Dees, your L-1011 project pilot. And we thought you'd like to know a bit of what we've been doing up here in the flight test program. We begin on the morning of February 16th with the first flight of ship number two. With Ralph Coakley in the left seat, the flight progressed smoothly without any snags, and we established 10,000 feet and a speed of 300 knots. On February the 24th, we had two TriStars flying together. At this time, we had 64 hours and 20 minutes flying time and 26 flights. The first other than Lockheed pilots to fly was Captain Hoshibushi of All Nippon Airlines. During the flight, All Nippon were greatly impressed with the simplicity of our aircraft and the controllability of all systems. Captain Hoshibushi proved the airplane in the air and he shot his first landings with gusty winds up to 35 knots. Captain Hasebushi did a very good job of flying the airplane and commented that this is one of the best, simplest airplanes that he has flown. Early in March, Ship 1 was continuing into the performance program and into the flutter program. This onboard data acquisition system with onboard analysis assured that the flight was progressing as planned. The water ballast system enables us to vary CGs to obtain the most out of each particular flight. The flying tail on the airplane has been a joy to fly. On April the 4th, we ferried the airplane to Edwards Air Force Base for an early morning takeoff the next day at the maximum weight the airplane has been in the air. This was 404,570 pounds. You will notice Mr. Weaver wasted no time in pulling the gear this morning. This established the maximum weight in the air and the longest flight on the aircraft to date of six hours and 41 minutes. The prime reason for the heavyweight takeoff is that this is a basic configuration in the flutter program. Oscillating vanes on the wing tips put a control frequency into the aircraft to get the structural response of the wings in the airplane. The vanes input approximately 200 pounds oscillating load on the wingtips. The first thing that you do on a new speed is a control pulse input. The pilot hits the ailerons in a real sharp fashion so that you get one fast, sharp control input. The envelope expansion program will be completed in the near future. On April the 27th, we made our first completely automatic landing, a tremendous accomplishment as this was the second flight the autopilot had been engaged. The airplane is intercepting a localizer for a hands-off auto approach. The gear is coming down at this time. We have intercepted the localizer and we're coming up on the glide slope. Notice the hand placement of Raf Coakley. He is guarding the wheel but not touching it. And notice how correctly the airplane is tracking the center line of the runway. It is glued right to the middle on the first approach we've ever tried. In this stop, we are applying maximum braking with no thrust reverses. 
there is good anti-skid action on the left-hand tire, and the airplane is stopped in approximately 2,500 feet from touchdown. The braking system has proved itself to be quite good and very smooth to pilot application. On May 22nd, former astronaut Frank Borman, now an Eastern Airlines senior vice president, flew ship one, and after the flight, he talked about it with the press in front of Eastern ship number three. Colonel Borman, how did the L-1011 handle for you? From a pilot standpoint, it's uh, superior. Yeah, it has excellent <coughs> visibility, handles well. The systems are extremely well laid out and simple. We spent about two hours uh, examining most of the uh, regions of the envelope that's already been explored, and it, it truly is a fine airplane. Uh, it responds very well, so that you can uh, say the flight crews will be happy. I think that uh, the Rolls-Royce engine is a fine engine. The unanimous unanimous recommendation of our people is we to stay with it to the left. Check some stability of the boat dynamic. Following its first flight in mid-May, Ship 3 in Eastern Colors was quickly gathering flight time. This time, the combined total was 220 hours on Ships 1, 2, and 3. Particular emphasis was being placed on gathering flight time for Ship 3, as this is our TriStar at the Paris Air Show. Getting ready was a bit hectic, especially outfitting the cabin, as the number three TriStar was the first to have passenger accommodations. As you can see, they've done a beautiful job. For the technically inclined Paris Air Show Vista, the forward section was left in its original flight test configuration, and of course, will be used for continuing flight test work. Along with us, Easton was busy in preparing to show off the TriStar and its new uniforms. Picture taking was the order of the day. On May the 28th, Ship 2, with PSA officials aboard, demonstrated the ease of flight in and out of Hollywood Burbank. and some Burbank employees got their first look at the TriStar in action. On June the 8th, Ship 3 returned to Palmdale from the Paris Air Show. Chuck Wagner was there to greet the crew and congratulate them on a very successful tour. He described some of the highlights to employees and families there for the occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, and all those here associated with this program today, I'm sure are very, very proud. Another wonderful milestone in the history of Lockheed and the story of, or the saga of TriStar 3. This crew has taken this airplane, flown to the Paris Air Show, where I can assure you it was an outstanding success. And those that witnessed the arrival of this plane at Paris as did Bill Moran, myself, Lloyd Frisbee, a lot of other Lockheed people, really felt a great surge of enthusiasm and appreciation and, and a lot of inspiration to see that plane glide quietly over that very famous place where Lindbergh had landed many years before. While today, of course, we're going through these troubled times, I think a great big plus was made when this crew and this airplane 
land at the Paris Air Show. A lot of people didn't think we'd make it, but we were there on time. We had a great crew, it was a real select crew. Everybody had a mission to perform. I can tell you, as the airplane was traced alongside of the DC-10, none of us here have anything at all to feel in the least bit reluctant about. We have a beautiful airplane, and much more so than our competition. We do uh, think that this is the first of the wide-bodied trijets to land on European soil. And we are most happy to welcome all of you to be with us uh, for this conference this morning. And I'd like to introduce the chairman of the board of Eastern Airlines, Mr. Floyd Hall, and have Floyd say anything that he would like to say to you this morning. Speaking for our company, this event here today, I think, validates an assumption that we made several years ago that this airplane, with its particular engine, would be one of the finest airplanes in commercial service. And we have never lost that faith. We still believe that it, will, that it will be, when it is in commercial operation, one of the finest airplanes right. uh -huh. as far yeah. as the traveling public right. here is concerned. We've moved on down the engines right in the center of the fuselage, which lets us keep us wider back here, therefore we can get more seats in. Uh -huh. Oxygen masks and all those will drop right out from the ceiling when they come down. Looks like you get me in the middle again. Good racket is going this <laughs> Oh, it's great! It's great. These seats are a lot more comfortable than the ones we're riding in on DC-8. people went through the airplane, fellas, in uh, East Midlands, whether there's anything left of the uh, carpeting or not, but if Bob Christie of Air Canada happens to be here, man, we really proved those floorboards, I gotta tell you. They took an awful beating, and uh, how'd you like to take a look at the inside of the airplane? The line forms to your left, and uh, give you an opportunity to go up and take a look at the airplane. How's that? With the envelope expansion program behind us, we have been conducting stall tests on ship one. The airplane has no surprises for the pilot and is smooth in a stall, either in the clean configuration or with the gear and the flaps extended. Notice the high angle attack, about 22 degrees. Minimum stall speed was approximately 100 knots. FAA stall certification test will begin in November. At Edwards Air Force Base, we began our minimum unstick speed test. With the flying tail, the aircraft can be rotated to a desired angle and held there with no difficulty right through the liftoff.
In this run, the fuselage was held within two feet of the ground. Further unstick speed test will be run on TriStar 1 with a special tail skid installed. By early July, we had put over a thousand flight hours on the RB211 engines. This flight, the 127th flight of the L-1011, we have a thousand hours RB211 engine time on the uh, L-1011 airplanes. The RB211 engines, the new engines that we have on this airplane now are the so-called three pluses, which give us a, a certificated level of thrust. We're operating this airplane now with the engines to uh, equivalent of the certificated thrust level that we will have when we get a ticket on the engine. The handling characteristics of the uh, engine from a pilot standpoint have been uh, extremely well received by all the guys that have flown the airplane. We all know the TriStar is quiet but we had to find out just how it measured up to the FAA noise regulations. With the quiet desert as a background and this sensitive sound recording equipment, we were able to obtain accurate noise level data. Tests show the TriStar to have the lowest noise level of any large jet now flying are expected to fly. This puts it well within the FAA requirements for the 70s and 80s. Ship 2 has been doing extensive cruise performance evaluation with the pre-certification engines rated at 42,000 pounds thrust. In this phase of testing, we look at engine fuel consumption and the efficiency of the engine airframe combination. A lot of performance data for the customer comes out of this kind of flying. In July, TriStar 2 flew to Oakland International Airport for some Autoland touch and goes. On the way up, we went by Moffett Field and LMSC to give the missiles people a look at the L-1011. Oakland has one of the most stable ILS systems in the country. The result was as smooth an approach and touchdown as you ever get in an airplane. TriStar 1 is entering the airloads testing, and we've hung a 21-foot gust boom on the nose of the airplane. Sensors in the boom measure the gust intensity before the airplane can react to this gust. Initial flights with the boom have been out over the mountains in search of rough air.
We figured the L-1011 would be a popular airplane, and Paris and Darby proved that it is. In early August, we got another chance to show our TriStar. We flew the airplane to San Juan, Puerto Rico. On the 8,000-mile test flight, we evaluated operations in subtropical climates. It was hot and humid, but that didn't keep our 20,000 visitors from coming out to take a look. Our airplane stayed open all day. At Miami, some 4,000 Eastern Airlines people got a special preview of the TriStar, and Captain Mike Finello, Eastern's Vice President of Operations Coordinator, told the press how the 1011 would help their passenger business. It's just great because we're looking forward to introducing this airplane into our schedules uh, next year, as you know, uh, toward the end of the spring, our first delivery coming in March. We're particularly pleased that we can show it to our employees, show it off to Miami and the state of Florida, being the probably the most advanced airliner to be introduced to this company, the quietest, the cleanest airliner in the sky. So we sort of look upon it as a, a family airplane. On the way home, we swung by the Georgia Company, where the 1011's wing was designed and its empennage is built. Well, that's about it. We have been busy. We've flown approximately 570 hours and 196 flights to date. This leaves us about 1,000 hours of flying before we get our FAA ticket in April. And that's a lot of flying. And as they say, you have to get up early.